Nico Jenkins. We're starting off strong with Nico Jenkins, in a quiet suburban neighborhood where most 15-year-olds enjoy video games, skateboarding, and the simple joys of hanging out with friends, Nico Jenkins took a different path. Diagnosed with mental illness at the tender age of nine, Jenkins found himself behind bars serving a staggering 189-year prison sentence for a carjacking charge. On a quiet morning in August 2013, a police officer found two victims, Juan Uribe Peña and Jorge C. Cachiga Ruiz, deceased in a truck at 18th and F Street. They were tricked into going there, thinking they'd meet a girl. A week later, a store worker found Curtis Bradford deceased outside at 18th and Clark Street. Jenkins uploaded a picture with Bradford on Facebook the day before. He got help from his sister, Erica, and mom, Lisa. Lisa got 10 years for helping Nico buy ammunition, knowing what he did. Soon after, at about 2.15 a.m. on August 21st, another grim discovery was made. Andrea Kruger became the next victim, found by a cop responding to gunshots at 168th and 4th Street. She was on the road with multiple shotgun wounds to her face, neck, and shoulder, all from a 12-gauge shotgun. Surveillance footage showed Andrea Kruger locking up the Deja Vu Lounge at 1.47 a.m. on that fateful night. Later, her stolen SUV was discovered. Well, we believe it's important. We've, uh, we have up to $1,000 available in Crime Stoppers uh, funds to, to, uh, to put to this effort. Uh, this, this case is active and ongoing, and we're trying to go where the evidence uh, takes us. And right now, he's an individual we need to, be, we need to speak with. On August 30th, 2013, Jenkins got arrested for unrelated terroristic threats. Cops, having a growing pile of evidence linking him to the murders, questioned him in jail. Even with mounting evidence, Jenkins denied any connection to the murders. Uh, but I want you to understand something, and I'm going to say this very clearly. I was not there. Only thing I was was for hearsay, not hearsay, but to say, like, okay, my religion of Catholicism, that's the underworld. He was like on the mummy, the black book. So this was them, my little cousins, the one that were in the house with me. That when I got to serve the search warrant. Right. This was their ritual of sacrifice. His denial lasted until September 3rd, when he made a full confession. I never knew the who, the what, the when, the where. Only thing I gave was the intelligence. Okay, describe this to me. What, what, this, this 9 millimeter, describe it to me. Describe the weapon? Yes. It's a, it's a high point. It's a high point. I believe it's a high point rifle, but it shoots 9 millimeter slugs. And if you was to see this weapon, you would not believe that it was the murder weapon. Like I said, weeks prior to this, when I first got out, I gave intelligence. Like I said, I didn't know who was coming, what was coming, who was it going to be used on. All I did was give the intelligence. What kind of intelligence? Intelligence of when would be the best window of opportunity. What roles to take in if you're going to do something way out west, they have cameras on the lights. Um, as you know, when you take Fort from uh, Military Ave, it takes you all the way out with no cameras, pitch black at nighttime. You realize that one, right? So if you're coming from that crime scene, you can hit it straight out Fort, straight out to Fort, and take Fort all the way back to Military Ave, all the way to the Walmart. That's off the, right off the interstate. Ain't that Walmart right off the interstate? Off of Military Ave? Yeah. yeah. So my point is, I, things like that, the intelligence of what paths to take, you know what I mean, to avoid the cameras, things of that nature. In an eight-hour confession, Jenkins went on rambling about how the acts were sacrifices to Apophis. The police charged him with four counts of murder. Jenkins pleaded guilty to all four counts, expressing in handwritten letters that he would defend Apophis's kingdom with animalistic savage brutality. In October 2015, while waiting for trial, Jenkins, known for self-mutilation, attempted to change his appearance to resemble the ancient god Apophis. Count three, possession of a deadly weapon by a prohibited person, class 1D felony, 45 to 50 years to run consecutive to all murder convictions at counts 1, 4, 7, and 10, and count 2. A psychiatric evaluation concluded that Jenkins was pretending to have psychotic symptoms. Despite his claims of battling schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and obsessive-compulsive disorder, the evaluation revealed 
antisocial personality disorder. Deemed competent to stand trial, Jenkins proved disruptive during the proceedings. He frequently spoke in tongues, laughed during prosecutors' descriptions of the deaths, and talked with Apophis. In May 2017, Jenkins received a death sentence for the murders and an additional 450 years on weapons charges linked to the crimes. Therefore, this panel finds that the death penalty is appropriate, should be, and is hereby given for each of the four murders by the defendant. It is therefore the sentence of this court as follows. At case CR 13-2768, count one, murder in the first degree, a class, four, class one felony, death. Count two, use of a deadly weapon, firearm to commit a felony, a class one C felony, 45 to 50 years to run consecutive to all murder convictions at counts 1, 4, 7, and 10. Count 3, possession of a deadly weapon by a prohibited person, class 1D felony, 45 to 50 years to run consecutive to all murder convictions at counts 1, 4, 7, and 10, and count 2. Tyrone Johnson. Our next case is another highly controversial one. On October 21, 2018, a chilling 911 call reported that a man had shot two people and claimed self-defense. The caller was Tyrone Johnson. Detectives later learned that the incident unfolded during a verbal dispute with his girlfriend, Stephanie Willis, over changing the television station to watch a football game. I changed the TV. You changed the TV? To football. Okay. Using a Glock 22.40 caliber pistol kept in their home, Johnson fatally shot Stephanie Willis and then targeted her 10-year-old son, Ricky Willis, who was hiding under his bed. Johnson had lived with Willis and her son for about a year. Stephanie Willis, a home health aide providing care for seniors, was originally from Beaufort, South Carolina. At the time of his murder, Ricky Willis, a fifth grader, played the drums. Johnson was in a state of hysteria from the moment he entered the interrogation room. <laughs> He claimed that his girlfriend blamed him for his own son's suicide. He claimed that he felt under attack by Stephanie and had no choice but to shoot her. When Ricky came running into the master bedroom, he got caught in the crossfire, he said. Whose blood's on your hand? It's hers. Her blood. Okay. Once you start firing, did you fire into? I just fired, sir. You just started firing. So you're now you're sitting on the ground on your butt, firing. So they're basically standing up. Let's say you're sitting on the floor and they're standing up. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Yes, sir. And she had to just But prosecutors painted a different picture. They believed that Johnson first shot his girlfriend and then looked for Ricky, who was hiding. Bullet casings were discovered under the little boy's bed, which proved them right. The state knowing nothing about me would have me believe that before I knew was a vicious man who went hunting for human lives. In the end, the prosecutors decided that Johnson deserved the death penalty. Suffice it to say that a precious child is dead. This murder was heinous, atrocious, and cruel. For those acts, I sentence you to death. Lonnie Franklin Jr. Now, onto our last case, a chilling case of a cold-blooded serial killer. The deaths in the mid to late 80s coincided with a surge in slayings associated with the crack cocaine epidemic. During that period, Multiple serial killers were active in the same area, including Michael Hughes, convicted of killing seven women, and Chester Turner, responsible for the deaths of 14 women and a fetus. But the grim sleeper stood out as the most persistent among them. His targets were women who were often addicts or prostitutes, and he disposed of their naked bodies alongside roads or in the trash. Many of these women were initially listed as Jane Doe's, and their deaths attracted little, if any, media attention. The police, despite suspicions that a serial killer was preying on black women, kept the slayings quiet, an unsettling decision that sparked outrage and condemnation from those who believed the killer's longevity was enabled by police indifference. Authorities managed to connect the slayings through ballistic and genetic evidence at the crime scenes, 
and they all pointed to a single perpetrator. A breakthrough in the Grim Sleeper case finally occurred in 2010 when a search of state offender records revealed a partial match. The individual identified was not the suspected serial killer, but attention shifted to a close relative. Investigators honed in on the convict's father, Franklin. In the summer of 2010, after tailing him to a pizza joint in Buena Park, police collected a slice of partially eaten pizza. DNA testing provided a conclusive match. Yet, during interrogation, Franklin firmly denied any knowledge or connection to the victims, despite the mounting evidence against him. I mean, how would your DNA get there? What logical reason? I don't, I have no clue. No clue. I mean, I don't have no clue how my DNA would get there. This young lady, Lucretia Jefferson. No. He also denied owning the firearm. It's a 25 caliber. A pistol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over the. Sh that's not mine. It's not. No, that's my brother-in-law's. Um, Joe Roy Nino. He had two. I have two things of his. He got evicted. The Grim Sleeper case is particularly haunting because, despite having proof of his involvement with 25 victims, police discovered a cache of over 1,000 photos and videotapes of women and teenage girls in Franklin's possession. Many of these women are believed to be potential victims whose bodies have never been found. Following Franklin's arrest, his lawyers attempted to argue that the DNA evidence collected from the trash can constituted an illegal search, but their efforts were unsuccessful. Franklin was eventually convicted of killing nine women and a teenage girl between 1985 and 2007. On August 10, 2016, he received a death sentence for his crimes. Why did all of this happen? Why did you do all of these things? All of these women were defenseless. They were not a threat to you in any way, shape, or form. And after thinking about it, and pondering it, and going over it in my mind, I've come to this conclusion, that it doesn't matter why. I can't think of anyone that I've encountered in all my many years in the criminal justice system that has committed the kind of monstrous and the number of monstrous crimes that you have. All of these people have been suffering and will continue to suffer, but hopefully, as many of them said, they feel they're going to receive some peace, and I hope that you are able to leave here with some peace today. But it's not vengeance, it's justice, Mr. Franklin. And so, at this time, I will say that um, the defendant is not eligible for probation, and probation is denied. And so, Lonnie Franklin Jr., for the first degree murder of Deborah Jackson, as alleged, as alleged in count one, in the special circumstance of multiple murder, it is the judgment and sentence of this court that you shall suffer the death penalty. The total non death sentence is life plus 25 years to life plus 14 years, all of that um, consecutive. Throughout the trial, Franklin maintained his denial of any involvement in the crimes. However, on March 29, 2020, it was reported that Franklin was found unresponsive in his cell. The cause of his death remains unclear, and at the time of discovery, there were no signs of trauma. That was it for today. If you found these cases as fascinating as they are chilling, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more true crime content. We're always on the lookout for the next topic to share, so drop a comment below and let us know what kind of stories you'd like to see in the future. Until then, Stay curious, stay safe, and we'll see you in the next video.